with Tarza. Um, Tarza was um, the, uh, the Basque um, intern here, um, summer of 2019-20. She uh, got trapped here by the, uh, by the lockdown. So she was here from uh, November 20 or December 2019 all the way until October. I think she quite enjoyed being uh, locked out in, in, in South Africa. But she's going to tell us about the, um, the, the, the most important thing she, she came to do, and that was um, to, um, to assist with the um, um, monitoring of the oyster catchers on um, Robben Island. So uh, Itazo and Ria uh, did that, and, uh, and Itazo is um, speaking on behalf of all of us who were involved in the monitoring. So thanks, Itazo, and over to you. Okay. Great, so thank you Les for the introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I came, well, I went <laughs> to South Africa to monitor the African black oyster catchers in 2019, 2020. But this is something that Les has been doing since um, 2001. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the monitoring we did and the results we, we had. So, well, Robben Island is a known place. Uh, historically, it's known. Uh, it was a jail, and then until 1993, 92. And then, uh, well, nowadays, it's a World Heritage Site, uh, in, and it's a museum. And this is this this one here is the classical view you get from 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 Robben Island. So, Robben Island is located like 10, 10 kilometers away from Cape Town. Uh, there's people living in Robben Island. Uh, however, they are all uh, in, a, in, a, in an area of the island and the impact they do on the coastline, it's, it's very low, almost nothing. And uh, Robben Island also receives tourists every day. Uh, however, they are not allowed to, to walk on the coastline. So again, the, the impact on the coastline nowadays, it's, it's very low. And uh, less known, but also very important, Robben Island is an important marine conservation area for um, a lot of coastal uh, bird species uh, and marine. As for example, uh, kelp gulls here, uh, swift terns, cape cormorants, and the endangered Afri African penguin. And there is also some migrant species as, a, as the turnstone that they use the, or they go to, the, to Robben Island during the, the summer the Austral summer. And Robben Island is also an important um, breeding area for our protagonist today, the African black oyster catcher. So um, for most of the South African people, uh, the African black oyster catcher is a known bird. Uh, however, probably for other people in other places in Africa or in, in the world, no, uh, because this is an um, endemic species to, the, uh, to Southern Africa. So it's uh, distributed in almost all the coast of um, South Africa, and also in the south of Na in the coast of Namibia, more scattered uh, populations. Uh, Robben Island and other offshore uh, islands are very important for this species for the breeding of this species. But however, these uh, birds they also nest in the mainland. Uh, so let's talk about the breeding season. That's what we monitor. So the breeding season of oyster catchers occurs during the austral summer, which is between October and March. Um, these birds are territorial, so they usually they keep a territory every year. That the one that's where they they feed and they feed their chicks. That's where they they made the nest and um, when, where they have the, their chicks. Uh, they are long-lived species and they mate faithfully. So every year they they have the same the same partner. Um, during our during the austral summer, what we did was monitor the oyster catcher nest, which is not a very easy task to do because I don't know if you can see, but the eggs are very similar to the um, to the rocks. So here in the in the bottom of the picture, you can see this is a nest with two eggs, which yeah, by color is very, very similar. So uh, they, they usually they nest uh, up. So there is a mark of the high tide. So they nest 
up that mark um, and that's the the coast we were patrolling looking for nest so you have to be very careful because they are yeah not that easy to see and um, nests are made in different substrates they actually I don't think they make a nest it's more as, an, as a scrape as you see here it's a, like a little hole with with the eggs and it can be they they made them in cells or rocks and sand uh, sometimes they decorate them with cells or with kelp. Sometimes they made just as simple as that. Um, so what we did, uh, we tried to go every six days to Robben Island and walk around the island, which is 10 kilometers, uh, looking for nest. So it's in that from the, up, the upper uh, tidal mark, we walked um, looking for them. And once we found a nest, we will uh, mark the nest uh, with coordinates and measure and weigh the eggs. We will also mark them so we could go and every time visit the nest to see if, if still they, they were still there. Uh, not only that, we also did the monitoring of the of the adults, uh, of, the, well, of the individuals. So we will also walk around the island uh, during the spring tides because yeah, the 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 high spring tide actually because the level of the of the sea is very high. So it's easier to see the to see the oyster catchers because they can't hide behind the rocks. So we will walk and uh, count them one by one and uh, georeferenciate them. So uh, this is the results we had for 2000. Oops, sorry, for 2019, 2019 and 2020. Here in the map you can see Robben Island and all the white dots are all the nests we found uh, so as you see we found them along the, the whole island but especially they were concentrated in the south oh sorry in the north of the island also in the south and some in the east and in the west they weren't as many so this part is the part of the island that is the most exposed to the to winds it's it's very rough and there is a lot of vegetation coverage and not as many either places for 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 the breeding or breeding places for oyster catches. So here I'm putting the results we found in the in the this the breeding season we monitor the 2019-2020 and then I'm comparing with some of the previous breeding seasons also in Robben Island. So this uh, year we found 158 nests which is a lot higher to what was found in 2001 which was 68 nest so the number of nests has almost more than doubled by now again the oyster catchers it's a little bit of the same pattern in 2001 they counted 150 oyster catcher individuals and this year we counted 550 individuals which is more than three times uh, more oyster catchers in the island it's, it's quite a lot and uh so why is this increase so the increase in number and number of oyster catcher and nest is, uh, we think, is due to the Mediterranean mussel. So this is an invasive uh, mussel species that was uh, first recorded in South Africa in 1979, um, and nowadays it's the dominant species along the South Af the whole South African coast. Um, in Robben Island, it was well there was a study. They made a study in 2003 and they found that the mussel was present there, but uh, basically it was mainly in the lower uh, intertidal zone. And after that, we don't know what happened with the mussel because no one went back and, and did the same study. But we assume that considering what has happened in the rest of South Africa, that probably by now uh, this mussel is dominant also in the coast of Robben Island. And this, um, in, in, this invasive mussel has done that the, uh, that the population of oyster catcher to increase. So um, in, two, in 2000, in the 2000s, the, the species, the oyster catcher was classified as near threatened. However, seven years after they, they upgraded it to least concern because of this huge increase. Uh, however, um, the population globally it's not it's not big because it's an endemic species, and because of the continuous development on the coastline, this this can be a threat for the species. So I think it's important that we keep monitoring the species to see how it's doing. 
um, I forgot forget to say that it was introduced in, in 17 in the 1970. That's that's for curiosity in Saldaña Bay here, I am north of Robben Island. Uh, there was an ore. Well, there, or, I don't know if there is, but there was an ore factory, and that was open two two years before that. So, which was introduced probably uh, on that way. That way. Uh, well. Uh, what happened in Robben Island with the with the introduction of Mediterranean mussel? So the this in the graph here below, this the x-axis is the coastline of uh, Robben Island. So we have cut it the coastline and stretch it. And um, this is in 2001. This the dashed line shows the density of oyster catchers along the coast, and we see that for 2011, the continuous line that density has almost doubled along the, the whole coastline, the, the oyster catcher density. So that uh, means that there is more oyster catcher in per, per place, in, the, in more oyster catcher uh, pairs in, in, in that zone. So uh, the territories has have shrink. So um, let's say that before the introduction of the Mediterranean mussel in 2001, the territories were bigger and they had uh, the native food source, right? And by now in 2019, because there are more oyster catchers, the territories are smaller, but the food uh, source is still, oh, it's even higher, I don't know, but it's still good because of the, because of the Mediterranean mussel, right? Um, so it's, it's, I mean, they have uh, smaller territories, but they have uh, still a lot of food. And, and that doesn't ha doesn't hasn't been a problem on producing uh, eggs or yeah our nests. Um, well, but now uh, territories are so so small that basically we can't find nests close to each other. So before uh, we were able to differentiate, well, not when not when I was here, but in the previous breeding seasons, they were able to differentiate each breeding each breeding territory. To which, uh, from which um, breeding pair was, but nowadays they are so all, they are all together and we are not able to differentiate by territories. But we know from the previous breeding seasons that 84% of the of the nests were from first breeding attempts. So uh, that means if we if we take into account what we found in 2019 that there were uh, 158 nests, we know that from those. 133 were first breeding attempts, which means that they, they are 103 breeding pairs. So the rest of the eggs are, uh, the, sorry, the rest of the rest of the nests are second or third breeding attempts that they do when they lost the first clutch, when it's lost, then they retry and they reproduce again. So if we have 133 breeding pairs, that means that they are 266 individuals that they hold a territory, a breeding territory. And if we compare that with the 550 oyster catchers that we found, that leaves us with 284 individuals that they don't have a territory for breeding. And we call them, uh, we call them the waiters. So they are, you can see them in big groups, even like 20 in numbers of 20 altogether, not in pairs waiting or making pressure in a in a cup in a pair for for a territory to be free um, then I, another result we found is the phenology so this is when when they nest so in this plot we plotted the breeding season so the day zero is the um, first of november and the day 120 is the end of march so here we can see that there are uh, different peaks of when incubation started, right? We counted five. It's they are so with the gray dust lines, uh, four bigger and one smaller one, and th th those are the peak of when the incubation of the oyster catcher nest started. If we see that together with the lunar cycle, uh, we can see that there is a pattern. So what what happened in each lunar cycle when we have full and a uh, new moon? Um, there is also when we have the springtime, the highest and the lowest tides, right? So we, 
the 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 spring tide at are here it's are represented by the start of the blue rectangle and the blue rectangle means the time that passed from the spring tide to the peak of egg incubation and we see that there is there is always like between 12 days from the from the spring tide until the the peak of the egg incubation and and that and that means that so Oyster catchers are they wait until they see the spring tide, the maximum the, the spring tide, right? The maximum level. So they make sure what's the highest level the ocean is gonna reach to nest above that line and make sure that the ocean is not gonna wash their, their nests. So that I think that's a very interesting results. However, I think we need a little bit more of investigation too. That's a little bit of a suggestion we, we make. Well, and now I'm going to talk about the last of the results, which is the nest success. And for that, first, I want to introduce a little bit the different predators that the oyster catchers can have, the oyster catcher eggs can have on Robben Island. So the first one here is the mole snake. The mole snake are native to Robben Island. Um, they were, so they think that when Robben Island was connected to mainland, uh, there were snakes, and then when the sea level rise and Robben Island became an, became an island, uh, some of the snakes were isolated, and that was the Robben Island population. And Robben Island mole snakes are different behaviorally and physically to the ones in the mainland. The main diet of mole snakes in Robben Island is um, ground nesting birds, as oyster catches. And uh, however, uh, before 2019, it was observed just once the predation of a uh, oyster catcher nest by a, uh, by a mole snake. That was in 2003. After that, they made an intensive monitoring to try to find more mole snakes predating eggs, but they didn't find any. So we assume that they were minor or occasionally were mole snakes predating oyster catcher eggs. Uh, the biggest predator, it has been the, in the feral cat that was introduced as a pet in Robben Island, however, then became invasive and the population increased a lot. That caused a drastic decrease in the success of the eggs, because in 2004, uh, 83 of the total nest oyster catchers were, were predated by, by cats. After that, uh, cats were cooled, and um, now, well, they, they were they weren't removed completely from the island, but um, but we didn't find any when we were there in 2019. So probably, the, if there are some, the population is very small. And finally, the kelp ghoul. So kelp ghoul uh, was first uh, recorded in Robben Island when breeding kelp ghouls were first recorded in Robben Island in 2000. In 2000, they were found the first five nests, but by now, by today, they would, well, last year, they counted 2,829 nests, which is an incredible increase on the breeding colony of kelp ghouls. Uh, these are in the mainland. Kelp ghouls are known to be the main predator of oyster catcher eggs. However, in, in Robben Island, they have been um, sporadical, let's say something like sporadical egg predators. In 2002, some eggs were recorded with uh, kelp gold marks, but nothing as big as, as the cats. Um, now, before, so these, these three predators and um, with other biodiversity has caused a little bit of biological drama, like changes, ups and downs in the population of predators in, um, in Robben Island. So I'm gonna, tell you a little bit more about that. I think it's important to know the current or to understand the current situation in Robben Island. Okay, so as I, as I told before, we know that the uh, cat population was big in Robben Island. Um, and that made for Hartable's goals and swift turns to that they, they usually, well, they breed in Robben Island during the winter. So that the because feral cats were there, they left the island and they went to the mainland to breed. So, uh, mole snakes didn't have uh, eggs or food to eat during the, during the winter because uh, these birds weren't there. And that made the population of mole snakes to decrease. When cats were removed from the island, 
heartable schools and swift turns came back and they started breeding during the winter. And also that increased the breeding colony of kelp gulls that they breed during summer together with the African oyster catchers. That made the oyster, the, that probably made the molly snakes also population to increase because now they had food during winter and during summer. However, the removal of cats made also the European rabbit to increase. So rabbits were introduced also in Robben Island and they, at the beginning there were about 100 individuals, but by 2008 they were counted 25,000 individuals of rabbits. It's, 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 it's crazy. And uh, well, they, were, they are grazers, so they basically they ate everything, all the grass, bushes and everything from the island. And Robben Island at that time was like a desert, a sand desert. It was so much the grazing pressure that uh, there were recorded some rabbits climbing up trees to eat the leaves because there, there wasn't food. After that, they decided to remove the rabbits from the island. And when the rabbits were removed, the vegetation recovered. So this is a picture I took in 2019. So now the vegetation is looking more, well, it's looking recovered. And that probably also helped the um, population of molly snakes to increase because now they have a natural habitat and where they can hide. So for summarizing, these all biologic, these all interactions at the end made that the kelp good colony to increase and the molly snake population also to increase. How has this affected oyster catchers, right? This is again the Robben Island and we see the same nests as before, but now they have different colors depending on the status they had at the end of the breeding season. So green, the green ones, either the light ones or the dark ones, are the nests that were successful um, because they had at least one chick or yeah. And uh, the orange ones are the nests that were unsuccessful either because they were lost so we came back one day and they were no no not X, but we don't know exactly why. Um, or also it could be because they, they were abandoned. So the, the, the oyster catcher push out, they put out of the nest the egg. Also or because they were dead or broken or whatever. And then the red ones, they represent the um, nest that were predated. Then we also have here this yellow polygon, which is the kelp gull uh, colony. It's in the whole north of the island. And the snake represents the mole snakes that were observed during 2019. So we, I think we can see a very clear pattern here. And is that we have divided right the island in three zones. So the north with the one that is adjacent to the kelp gull, here the south part and the eastern part, right? So we can see that this north part, the one that is adjacent to the gull, that is this one, so most of the, the nests are located here, adjacent to the kelp gull colony, north part, and from the four jetty to the west end of the colony. And most of the nests that are located adjacent to the colony were successful, whereas most of the nests that were located in, were unsuccessful and most of them predated. So, well, let's talk about the successful nests. Um, a little bit less than half of the nest were successful, which means we had a chick. Um, oyster catcher chicks are beautiful. Uh, they look a little bit different to, to adults because they don't have that um, red characteristic beak or legs. They develop them later. They are very cute things to see. And uh, as we said, most of them were located adjacent to the kelp gull colony. So this suggests that there was an abridian case. What is an abridian case? Abridian is a term that was first defined by Ellenberg and Drake in 1992. And in these, uh, in these abridian cases, they are three protagonists. One is the predator, in this case is our mole snake. The other protagonist is an aggressive species that in this case is the kelp gull. And the third one is the beneficiary, the oyster catchers. So, well, we know that kelp gulls can be very aggressive, especially when they are nesting. They shout at you, they, I mean, are very, very aggressive. So probably 
at the beginning when there were very few nests of kelp gull in Robben Island, um, mole snakes were predating them. However, when the nest increased and the breeding colony became so big, they, they became very aggressive and now they could harass the mole snakes that were coming to predate them. So the oyster catches that were, pre that were nesting adjacent to the kelp gulls, they also were beneficiating from this harassment that the kelp gulls were doing and that prevent them to be predated by mole snakes. So summarizing that, we can say that kelp gulls are creating a protective screen that uh, against mole snakes and that oyster catchers are beneficiating for this, from this. On the other hand, we have the unsuccessful nests that was a little bit more than half of them. And, and here, uh, and from those, we found that 18 nests were predated by mole snakes. This is the first year that we actually found a mole snake actually seen how they predated. These pictures were taken by us, as, and you can see that it's, it's obviously clear that they are predating the eggs. Here you can see the mole snake, and here you see the eggs. And we also saw the mole snake just patrolling the, the coastline of Robben Island, exactly doing the same that we were doing. So they, they perfectly know the height at which oyster catcher nests are located. So that raises a question. Do we need to control mole snake population in Robben Island? So for answering this, what we did uh, was calculate, or we need to know how many fleds, uh, oyster catcher fledgings are produced in a year in Roman Island to decide if the population is stable or not. And we did that. So we know uh, that this year in, in 2019, 38% of the eggs hatched. And from those that hatched, more than half produce a fledging, so an, a, a bird that can fly. This data here, it's not from Robben Island, it's from other offshore islands. We couldn't calculate this, but we, we think it's, uh, we can assume that it's that because it's a mean from other offshore islands. So from those, these two data, we know that the probability of an egg to produce a fledging is of 0 0.25, sorry, 0 0.21. Then we also know that in Robben Island, they, they are, well, this year they were 133 breeding pairs. And those in average produce 2.17 eggs. So if we multiply 0 0.21 by 2.17, we have that the probability of a breeding pair of oyster catcher to produce a fledging is of 0 0.46. Now this one, well, maybe, says nothing, but if we compare it to what is established, it's established that to maintain a stable population of oyster catchers, we need that probability to at least be 0 0.33 and 0 0.46, it's higher than that. So then we can assume that the population, the population of oyster catchers in Robben Island is stable, even with the predation of mole snakes. So to conclude, we can say that since since the, since the two, 2000, there have been two management interve interventions, which is the removal of cats and rabbits, and two biological invasions, which is the Mediterranean mussel and the kelp gulls in Robben Island. And those have, in a way, impacted the breeding landscape of oyster catchers. Uh, we can also assume that the increase in number of nest and oyster catcher individuals in Robben Island is due to the invasive mussel and that the main predator of nest has shifted from the feral cats to mole snakes. And that probably kelp gull was never a, the main predator of, of oyster catchers. And then we can finally say that we need, at least from, from the point of view of oyster catchers, we need no interventions to control the population of mole snakes or kelp gulls. And well, that's all. Thank you very much. I know it's a lot of information. I hope you enjoyed and you, understood and thank you if you have any question. Okay. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, I see there is a lot of some questions. Um, so I don't know, Les, are you here? 
I mean, Liz knows more than me, you know, it's the culture, so, okay, maybe, you know. Okay, I'm going to try to answer those questions. Um, okay. Okay, so Ringin is asking, what happened between 2012 and 2019? Um, I think that's something. I think that they keep doing, they kept doing the monitoring, but they, we don't have that data now. So, uh, with, I mean, I think what happened is that the population kept increasing, nest number increased, and um, oyster number also increased. Right, Liz? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. It was an amazing talk. Oh, you guys. You really <laughs> oh, well done. Yeah. So you see the, 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 the comments here about fantastic work and well done and all the rest of it. Rio also had a, um, a big finger in the, in the pie doing the uh, field work. So uh, thanks Rio as, um, as well. So I think Itaza plans to submit the, uh, the paper on this to uh, wait a study before she goes to bed tonight. But maybe she's going to do the videos, I don't know. So thank you Itaza. Um, were, there, were there any other uh, actual questions in the... In the um, in the, in the, in the, in the chat. I think that there was that one about about what happened between 2012 and 2019. I don't think. Do you think something like like that impressive happened, or just they kept increasing gradually number of nests and number of in adults? I, I assume it was just a, a, a similar increase in the mole snakes slowly increased. Um, yeah. Okay, and 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 there is one for Jackie asking um, if it's any similar work on oyster catchers being done along the coast near Her Hermanos, Harmonious, Harmonious. <laughs> in mainland. Do you know if someone is studying oyster catchers on the mainland? No, I think um, I think our study is the most uh, detailed study. So we started in. 2001, 2002. Um, we haven't done it every year. We've skipped quite a lot of years, but we've tried to, in the years we've done the analysis, done the field work actually to try and find every nest on the island. So that's uh, that's the sort of target that not many people uh, do. So there's a question there: Would you actually remove a naturally occurring species yeah. like the mole snake? I think the reality is is that um, on a place like Robin Island. Um, this 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 debate over whether the mole snakes are naturally occurring or um, or not. So were they introduced? We're not really certain, but we think that they were uh, left behind with the last ice age. It's the only island which um, which has um, mole snakes, only also island which has mole snakes, and it's it's quite bizarre to watch the um, the mole snake predation because the Adults just stand around and, and watch their eggs being taken. It really is, you know, they really don't know what to do when a moss lake uh, predates, the, uh, predates the nest. There's no um, a fierce reaction what's, uh, whatsoever. Are we going to publish your results? Yes, yeah, we're submitting, yes. submitting the paper to uh, Way to Study, the journal of the International Way to Study Group uh, right, uh, right now. Yes. And then there is also a question in Facebook. It's asking, um, what is the trend on the mainland? Yeah, so oyster catch is also increasing on the mainland. It's because of the um, Mediterranean mussels. So there's been a massive increase in uh, oyster catcher numbers. And um, to, to the point where they're starting, they can't find territories to breed. So, uh, so they almost make a nuisance of themselves breeding on recreational beaches. And so the, um, the, um, the idea that oyster catchers are threatened is very much still in people's minds. And uh, so when they see a bird breeding on a recreational beach, they start chasing all the bathers and beach users away because this is an important bird. And the reality is, is that um, you know, they, they, they just can't find a place to nest, so they nest on the, on the recreational beaches as well. So I'm, I'm not saying that we should actually just uh, let the nests on the recreational beaches um, 
um, be, uh, be d disturbed and destroyed. But we have to be very careful how we message the, um, um, and how we approach people because we can very easily put people's backs up against the conservation sort of concept because we're, uh, we get so angry about um, the interactions with birds on recreational beaches. So that's another completely different topic. But it's a good news story, actually. And, uh, and it's um, Robin Island, 20 years, incredibly dynamic. Um, and I think we use the word drama in the paper. Yeah. With, um, the fluctuations and, and the shifts and the di dynamic of the, um, the predators and the prey and what, is, what has happened. And we hope that we can keep doing this monitoring uh, for, a, for a very long time. And I think we, we're hugely grateful to uh, Robin Island Museum. They transport us to the island for free. We have um, a house on the island that we can use. And, um, and that's an amazing uh, privilege. So we're hugely grateful to, um, to the island as well, island yeah. management. And there is, um, and I think it's an interesting comment in Facebook as well on Juden Island. I, I don't know what it is, but I, Juden Island. Is it? Saldana. Saldana Island. Yeah, that's, that's in Saldana Bay. Okay, so it's it's also saying that they were there in Jan from 25th of January to the 2nd of February, and they were very encouraged by the number of oyster catchers that they were there. They counted yeah. about 118 on half of the island alone. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. impressive. It's a, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's another island that's um, it's been invaded with uh, the Mediterranean mussel. Mm. So the Mediterranean mussel has essentially wiped out all the, um, well not all, but most of the indigenous species. And, uh, and what makes it so good for oyster catchers is that it, um, um, that the, the Mediterranean mussel occurs higher up the intertidal than the indigenous mussels do. So with every tide cycle, the, um, um, the oyster catchers have a longer period in which to feed. So it's, uh, it's, it's really been good for the oyster catchers, bad for, uh, for the other mussels. Yeah. Okay.